Okay, I'm just going to warn you all. This is going to be one of the more complicated videos ahead of time. I think not because of anything that I do, I think just because uh, this is kind of a hard concept. I'm introducing it pretty early in this video series, um, but uh, it's something that you know you, you will use and you will uh, want to come back to, uh, especially since there's a, a tool called the FM8, also made by Native Instruments, um, that is entirely based on this principle. Um, and I think I'll, I'll hope to explain why it's so usable and why it's so flexible and and what makes it so cool today. Um, and this tool that we're talking about is frequency modulation synthesis, or sometimes it's called FM. And you know, here's the thing: if you ever if you ever wondered about uh, FM radio, this is actually the same principle on how FM radio is working as broadcast, which is also pretty cool. We won't really go into how you know again radio does it, um, but it's the, it's using the same exact technique that we're going to use to synthesize new sounds today. Uh, so FM synthesis, here's a little bit of the history. It came around in the 1970s. There is a uh, composer slash sound engineer guy named John Chowning who first kind of came up with the idea. And I think actually there's a few others who should also get credit there too. Um, but he's kind of the one who eventually sold it to Yamaha. And Yamaha, and I should have Googled this earlier. Let's uh, just go to the Google. Let's not go there. Um, Yamaha uh, first put it in. Uh, their very famous keyboard called the DX7. Let's go to just the Wikipedia page. There's a picture. And you know the thing is that it didn't actually use um, technically, uh, technically, technically, it didn't use FM synthesis. It actually used a, a phase modulation synthesis um, implementation of the same idea. Um, but it, the end result was the exact same. So there's the keyboard. You've probably seen these around if you've been to any, uh, you know, any big studios. You know, everyone still has one. This is again one of the classic synthesizers uh, of the 1980s decade. I don't want that. Go away. Let's. Uh, and right there, you can see. Yep, John Chowning at Stanford University. Okay, so let's uh, go back to Cubase. And uh, we're going to talk about what this is. So you recall, let's start with the sine wave, because that's good. I have this little frequency spectrum over open over here on the left. You can see this. Uh, this is the new Cubase 1 in uh, Cubase 7 that comes in on all the channels. You can do a frequency spectrum for all the channels now, all at once, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can see when I play a sine wave, it's actually just making one frequency, right? This is a single individual tone, a single individual uh, you know, occurrence over time. And that's what it sounds like. And if I play a lower frequency, right, it'll be lower. And if I play a higher frequency, oh man, I just ate lunch and now I'm still burping. Pardon me. How about a higher one? We can go higher. All right, as I go up and down the piano, you can see me going up and down, right? I can make all sorts of nice, fun looking shapes. Isn't that cool? Okay. So we've also noticed a couple of videos back that Absinthe is a wavetable synthesizer. And because of that, whenever you want to change the timbre of something, you go and draw on this box, you actually can't make it sound bad. In other words, I can't draw an inharmonic sound. Every sound I play is going to have equally spaced harmonics. And this is a little bit hard to see because this graph is logarithmic, not linear. But all these different peaks are actually the exact same distance away from each other. right? So the first one's at 220, and then 440, and then 660, and then 880 and then 1320, and whatever the next one is, 1540 and 1760, they're all the same distance away. No matter what, you know, no matter what shape I put in here, I'll always get stuff that's always the same place away, right? You can see this, no matter how I change the shape, maybe the, the overall shape changes a little bit, but these individual spikes don't really go anywhere, right? No matter how I draw a different shape and change the sound. Okay, so this is a problem if you're a wavetable synthesizer like like Absinthe. You can't actually make um, sounds that have different moving parts. Well, you can. I, I showed you this, if you maybe if you recall, in the last video where we can add two different sounds together. And this is very easy, right? I just take two and I tune one to a different note. And I can tune the second one wherever I feel like it. And sometimes it'll be related like it is here. And it's harmonic. And sometimes it won't. You know how that sounds kind of bad? And I can add another one, right? We can just add these together. How about to oh, pick another somewhat irrational number? Right? 
So it kind of sounds a little bit like alien music, right? These things are out of tune with themselves. And again, these are not mathematically related by integer multiples, and that's what makes them sound kind of strange. Okay, but that, but you know, this is the only way you can do that in a wavetable synthesizer, right? Well, wrong. If I want to get inharmonic material, there is a whole other way we can do so, and it's a really efficient way, much more efficient than just adding you know, a million of these oscillators together. And really, I can't do that anyway because I only have three in absinthe, so that's out of the question. If I want to get, you know, if I want to get a whole bunch of different inharmonic parts, I have to open this plugin, you know, 20 times, and each time I can only add three new sounds to it. So let's not do that. Let's look at this other method. I'm going to put this in frequency modulation mode. Okay, so here's your definition for modulation. What modulation means is we're going to take one signal and use another signal to control some aspect of that signal. And in this case, uh, I'm going to use two sine waves. And I'm going to, let's just play. And what I have right now is I have one sine wave controlling the frequency content of another sine wave. And you can see already that it actually has, I'm only making two sine waves, but am I seeing just two frequencies? No, and I'm actually actually seeing at least eight about here. And I can change the note. So I'm already, um, this is already way more efficient than anything else I've ever showed you because before when I had to make that three, you know, peak sound, I had to add three different oscillators. Here I only have to add one and then modulate it. And not only that, I can make inharmonic sounds really easily just by changing the tuning between them. Right, so there's some pretty good inharmonic kind of sounds right in here. Very colorful, I guess, as we might say. And I also want you to notice when I get close to integer multiples, like three. Oops, well, not point one, three. I said it actually starts to sound harmonic again. It actually starts to sound musical. Okay, so what's happening? Well, oh, my computer is crashing. Why are you crashing, computer? Don't crash, I'm recording. Okay, still recording. Sorry, okay, uh, so why does this happen? Well, let's slow this down a little bit. Uh, instead of modulating a sine wave by a sine wave at some really high frequency, let's slow this down to some really slow amount. We'll say like 0.5 hertz. And we'll also up the index. So take a listen now. Can raise the index even more. Do you hear the pitch wandering a little bit? I can speed it up, make it more apparent. Okay, let's bring it back in. That was getting out of hand. Right about there. Do you see this frequency sort of going back and forth? That's because what I'm doing is I'm using one sine wave to actually determine what the frequency of the other sine wave should be. So think about a sine wave, right? A sine wave is just a shape, it goes up and goes down. I'm going to take that shape and instead of mapping it, you know, out to the speakers to be heard by all of our ears, I'm going to take that shape and just basically twist the frequency knob here up and down according to that shape. So it's almost as if I just took my mouse and was just moving this mouse up and down. Okay, and if I do that, I would make this sound. And let's actually turn down the index a little bit. And as I get faster and faster, you can actually see something strange already happens, right? I start turning up and down that frequency knob so fast that it doesn't generate just one pitch that's moving around anymore. Instead, it actually generates this huge wide range of frequencies that we hear. Okay, so this is called frequency modulation. Uh, and if we do it fast enough, and really the, the cutoff point is around 20 hertz. When I start to modulate this thing around 20 hertz, it no longer becomes one note. Let me turn it up. I think it's easier if I turn it up. Okay, so right, we have one note just sort of moving around. You know, one note staying still. Moving around again. Whoops, let's go slowly. 
right? It still sounds like, whoa, 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 whoa. Sounds like one note going up and down really fast. Right? It still has that kind of characteristic until it gets around 20. And now around here, it's starting to go so fast that I can't actually hear it going up and down anymore. It starts to just sound like it's a, a sound. It's just, it's just blah. Right, it's actually turning up and down that sine wave 231 times a second. Do you hear it turning up and down 231 times a second? Of course not. Instead, you hear this. That's pretty cool. Now there's a way we can we can actually predict what's going to come out of here. Right now it might seem like it's a little mysterious, it's a little oh random uh, perhaps, but there is a method. So let's here go this page. And the formula for almost all forms of modulation is basically going to be uh, what, what you're going to get out. I'll say the output, hello little pencil, there we go, writing today. The output is going to equal the sum and difference for all hertz or frequencies involved. Okay, so this is this might seem like Greek right now, but let me give you an example. So let's say I have a sine wave at 500 hertz. I'm going to draw kind of a weird graph. We haven't really seen graphs like this before, but uh, left to right is hertz. Let's say it goes from 20 to 20k, and up and down is amplitude. Okay, let's change my color. And so I have a tone, let's say right at 500 hertz, so somewhere around here, 500 hertz. I have a sine wave, okay? But I'm going to modulate it. I'm going to frequency modulate it by, let's say, 100 hertz. So in other words, I have one sine wave oscillator at 500, and I'm going to be turning up and down 500 hertz by 100 hertz, okay? That 100 hertz we don't actually hear on the graph. Instead, what's going to come out is 500 hertz plus the sum and difference for all the other frequencies involved. So this would be 500 plus 100. So I'll hear 600 hertz as well. And the 600 hertz is actually gonna be quieter than the 500 hertz in most cases. And we're also gonna hear the difference. 500 minus 100 is 400, so 400 hertz. And furthermore, if uh, depending on how loud this sound is, really just the amplitude, I'll also get the additional sums and differences. So I'll get 500 plus 100 plus 100. And maybe that'll go to 700. And 500 minus 100 minus 100. That'll go to 300. And the same is if I just keep turning up the, uh, the volume of this 100 hertz, I'll continue to get all these extra frequencies. So my resulting sound isn't just 500 hertz anymore. All I've taken is 500 hertz and 100 hertz, and yet from it I've been able to generate 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, and 800, right? So it's like I put two frequencies in and I get nine frequencies out. That's a pretty good deal. That's frequency modulation. That's why it's so efficient and so useful because you, you have to you know, care about extraordinarily little, you know, small number of information. You have to have a very small number of oscillators. All I have to do is put two things in and you can get a whole world of sounds out. Let's actually go back to Cubase and hear exactly this happening. And we'll also look at it in the chart. So uh, let's dial in, let's go back to my main tab. And I think we said 500 hertz. I don't know why it added a 0 .0001, but it annoys me. And let's put this index down to zero for now. And for Hertz, I said we're gonna modulate it by 100. And let's play a tone. And right now, right now I have it turned all the way down. That's what this FM index really means. It's, it's the volume. So I have it turned all the way down. So because I've, I have the modulator turned all the way down, all I'm doing is I'm hearing the carrier. The carrier is the name we give to the original one. Uh, so we have 500 Hertz right there. You can see it one spike on 500 Hertz. Yes, let's now T start turning up the volume of that modulator. And what we should be able to see is 400 hertz and 600 hertz start to come out and then 300 and 700 and then 200 and 800 and so on. There they are. All right, so
so I'll stop right about there. So I just that's what 500 hertz modulated by 100 hertz sounds like. And it's pretty cool. I mean, it's it's usable, right? I mean, it's uh, you know, it sounds like it's something, I guess. Uh, but I only put two frequencies in, and I just got out. Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe about 13. That's a good deal. Uh, frequency modulation uh, can do just so much more than that, though. Um, it can, again, modulate by inharmonic frequencies. So let's turn down the volume again. We can see the same thing happening. You know, 500 hertz modulated by 100 hertz sounds good because everything is related by 100 hertz, right? 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700. Again, recall my lecture on why, what, you know, what makes music sound good. It's the mathematical relationships. Let's use a non-good mathematical relationship. How will we modulate 500 hertz? But in this case, let's let's turn it up and down by about oh, let's say 87 hertz. How about 86.9 to be exact? All right, so still we have 500 hertz. And as I turn this up, I should see a new one created at 586.9 hertz and 500 minus 86.9 hertz. And as these get louder and louder, it's not really nice. I mean, it's kind of weird sounding, right? Whereas if I put this to 100 hertz, it's like, oh, there's music again, right? That's a note. That's a note that you can actually play and use. When I do it by 86.9 hertz, it's this kind of like noise. It's very unhappy. It's very unsettled. But sometimes you want sounds like that. And again, this is one of the methods you use to make them. So uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of Skrillex. Uh, you know, he uses a lot of FM synthesis and a lot of his patches to actually get a lot of those, you know, <laughs> kind of sounds, a lot of these really uh, noisy synths. You'll actually often start using this technique. Uh, so this is, you know, again, very basic introduction to that. Uh, you can take this in a lot further. Um, I suggest you go on, if you're really interested in it, go online and start looking up some FM synthesis, uh, you know, some readings about it. Uh, you can actually find books that just have formulas for how to make certain types of sounds. I mean, um, using FM synthesis, we've been able to make, you know, basically recreate all the instruments of the orchestra, although, you know, how good they are, eh, we don't really know. Oh, I mean, we know, but they're not, let's say they're not perfect samples, they're not perfect recreations, um, but you can imitate, you know, almost anything using this technique. Okay, so we're really just scratching the surface here. Um, but again, key idea, some key terms for you guys to know. FM synthesis stands for frequency modulation. We're using one signal called the carrier, and then we're going to turn up and down the frequency of that carrier by the modulator signal, uh, which is um, on this mod tab here. And basically the faster, you know, we turn it up and down, the wider these sidebands will come. In other words, this, the sums and differences will be further apart. Um, the FM index is also known as the amplitude of the modulator, and this will also determine how many of those sidebands we have, how many extra frequencies are we going to generate. And we can do this all the way to the point to white noise. Our definition of white noise is just all frequencies all played at once. Uh, it's pretty easy to actually create an absinthe using this technique. Instead of using a sine wave, I'm going to put in a sawtooth wave. And again, this is going to go to a whole new level right immediately, because now when I modulate a sawtooth wave by 100 hertz, I'm not just taking one frequency spike and putting new spikes on either side of it. I'm taking a whole series of spikes and adding new spikes everywhere around that. Okay, so you can get lots of these spikes very quickly. Right. Sounds pretty cool. Um, but in order to create noise, let's take another wave. I'll use this inharmonic sound. And all I have to do is basically modulate it by some inharmonic amount, something not related to uh, 500 hertz and just modulate the hell out of it and I might also help if I pick some a more noisy waveform over here let's do uh, it's pretty good that's pretty much white noise right we're just generating all frequencies across the board and again I'm doing it with just two oscillators, right? I'm actually able to generate complete noise with two oscillators. You should be feeling the power right now. You should feel uh, 
pretty awesome, pretty capable. That you can do so much with just so little. Okay. All right. I hope that was exciting. I hope you guys understood. Again, FM synthesis is a really hard topic, but I hope that stepped you through uh, mighty fine. All right. I'll see you guys in the next video where we'll continue to explore the world of absinthe.